Hi, this is Jeff Spence, your Math 135 instructor for the Community College of Denver. And this is our video lecture over 8.2, which is constructing the confidence interval for the population mean. The last section, 8.3, we're going backwards, I know, but the, we covered this before, was the confidence interval for estimating the population proportion, like the percent that's going to vote for a certain candidate or the percent that's left-handed. So in this uh, section, we're working with quantitative data and we're trying to estimate the mean. So if we wanted to figure out, say, the average height of all CCD students or the number of credits that uh, college students are taking or the number of hours worked per week that students uh, work, this would all be estimating a mean. Um, one of the big things is going to be that we're going to introduce a new distribution, the t-distribution, which is very much like the z-distribution, the standard normal distribution, when we look up z-scores but it's going to be a little different when we look them up. Um, and then we'll go through uh, the formula and show you a short example. So the t-interval for the mean can be, can, can be constructed when either of the following two conditions are met, if the population is normally distributed or the sample size is large enough, greater than or equal to 30. So generally we're going to satisfy the second requirement because we might not always know if the distribution is normal. So we're going to make sure that we have a large sample size. Um, and when we take a, a sample size, uh, and we, or sorry, when we take a sample, our best estimate of the population mean is our X bar, our sample mean. So remember, every confidence interval has the point estimate plus and minus the margin of error. And the margin of error involves now a T-score instead of a Z-score, and also the sample standard deviation divided by the square root of N. Remember that uh, the, dis the standard deviation of the distribution of sample means used to be the original standard deviation, sigma, divided by the square root of n. Well, the problem is, is if we don't know the mean, the population mean, mu, then we probably don't know the population standard deviation, sigma. <coughs> Remember, the population standard deviation is the average distance from the population mean. So it's going to be pretty hard to to figure out what the standard deviation is if we don't know the population mean. So we replace it with the sample standard deviation right here. And since we're doing that, we're using an estimate inside of an estimate in this formula, and we're going to use a t-score instead. A t-score will be a little bit further out from the center than a normal z-score. This alpha over 2 just represents the area in each tail. Don't worry about that so much, and I'll show you how we look up those t-scores. But here's our formula. X bar is our point estimate, plus or minus a margin of error, which involves a t-score times the standard deviation, the sample standard deviation, excuse me, divided by the square root of n. So this t distribution um, is is used because of the replacement of the uh, the replacement of the sample standard deviation for the population standard deviation. And so it's very much like a t it's, it's very much like a z-score. It still represents the number of standard deviations away from the mean, but it's also going to be dependent on our sample size. And we we talk about this with degrees of freedom. And degrees of freedom are always the sample size minus one. So generally, as our sample gets bigger, the closer the t distribution uh, gets to the, the z distribution, but we're definitely going to be using degrees of freedom, which is always the sample size minus 1. So the t distribution is, is very much like the z distribution we're showing here and you can see that um, as the as the sample size gets bigger okay the standard normal curve is this purple one as the sample size gets bigger you can see from the dotted red line to the teal line it's getting closer and closer to the normal distribution. Um, other things about the t distribution is exactly the same as the normal distribution in the sense that it's symmetric about its mean the area on the right and the left is point, both 0.5, and it still represents a number of standard deviations away from a mean. That's what a t-score represents. So now we're just going to have to understand how to look up these t-scores, because all the rest is still just plugging and chugging into the formula like we've done in the last unit. So um, we're going to have to look up a t-score, and I'm going to show how they did this. All right. So they're using a previous example, but I just want to show that if we're looking up a 95% confidence interval and our sample size is 20, 
how do they get this t equal to 2.093 so that's really what i want to work here i know that they have some information from the previous problem with uh where they figure out the margin of error but how did they get this 2.093 well there's two ways to do it first in your calculator if you go to second vars and you see the function inverse t then you can look up a t that way however not everybody has this function Anybody who has a TI-83 is most likely not going to have it. Um, and if you have a TI-84, you're most likely going to have it. So if you have the function, you can use it here. If you don't, then I'll show you how to use it in the table. But let me just use this function again. So remember, inverse T is very much just like inverse norm. It knows that left area. So if we're dealing with a 95% confidence interval, right here, 95% confidence interval, then the area in each tail is two and a half percent. Or sorry, the, the, there's the percent in each tail is two and a half percent. So as a decimal, we look up the area of 0 0.025. The degrees of freedom, well remember the sample size for this problem was 20. So we type in the degrees of freedom of 19, enter it in. And this will give us the negative value because it's a left area. So we can just use the positive. You see 2.093 and that's the value that we came up with right here. So you can use that in your formula for the margin of error and thus the confidence interval. But if you don't have that function, then you're gonna to have to use the T table. And I have this uploaded to D2L. I'll probably bring some printouts on Monday. So in case anybody needs this, this table, they can use it. Now, this table is a little different from the normal table and that it tells you that the column above or the, the row above is telling you the area in, in the right tail. And then we just line that we t pick up, pick the correct column, and then we scan down until we find the correct degrees of freedom. And remember, degrees of freedom is n minus 1. So if we're doing a 95% confidence interval, then we're looking up 0 0.025, like I typed in the calculator, 0 0.025. You scan down until you get to 19 degrees of freedom and see the 2.093. That's how they got that value here, same as the calculator. All right, the calculator will give you the negative, the table will give you the positive. It's up to you which one you want to use. But remember, when we do use the formula, we just compute the margin of error using the positive value. And that's really it. Once you look up the T-score, then we can plug and chug the formula. We'll have to have the sample mean. Let me go back to the formula. The sample mean plus or minus the T uh, the t-score for a given confidence percent times the standard deviation divided by the square root of n. Just going through some other examples, I mean, if we want a 99% confidence interval, that means that half of a percent is in each tail. 99% in the middle, which means half of a percent in each tail. If you're going to look up half of a percent, you'd be in the 0 0.005 column. If you were doing a 90% confidence interval, then that would mean 5% in each tail, and you would go down this column and match it up with the degrees of freedom. Or you can use the calculator inverse T if you have that function. But remember, any confidence percent is a middle percent. And I have a, a, a video on the Doceri on the iPad that I go through examples of constructing confidence intervals. On those examples, I mention what I would type in inverse T. If you don't have inverse T, then you're going to have to use this table. It's a pretty simple table to use. One last thing. If you're on the table, notice how the degrees of freedom goes by ones until you get to 40, then it's by tens, and then it jumps from 100 to 1,000. If you're ever in between a degrees of freedom, so let's say your degrees of freedom was 64, you would always round down to, to, lowest, to the next lowest degrees of freedom. In this case, it would be 60. If your degrees of freedom was 69, you would have to go down to 60. If your degrees of freedom was 500, you'd have to go down to 100. Always go to the, to the lower degrees of freedom if you're ever in between. Check out my example video, and we'll see you in class.